Do you know people in the United States spend over a billion dollars a year on fireworks? I think I, I've got a neighbor who probably accounts for like 50% of that. Um, <laughs> Now, most of those, of course, are purchased, you know, leading up to Independence Day, and you see stands, they pop up everywhere, right, all the parking lots. But literally, that investment of money is gone in a flash, right? <laughs> a billion dollars up in smoke. And why do people do it? It's for the whole thrill of the moment. Uh, but it's, it's so quickly forgotten. And I think, for some people, that's their experience of Christianity. It's kind of the same sort of thing. They come to a worship service or some kind of church event. They, they maybe hear something, some message, some truth about God. And they're emotionally moved by it. But it doesn't really amount to anything. Right? It's like this incredible experience, a momentary thrill. But they move on. They quickly forget it. There's no lasting change. Now, as we've been studying the Gospel of Luke, we've seen that these first two chapters are full of dramatic moments, right? I mean, people encounter angels, a virgin conceives, the Son of God is born. These are huge, huge events. But as we come to this passage today, I think what we see is that the true wonder uh, inspired by these events, should translate to lifelong spiritual devotion. And so what Luke does as he moves into this section is here in Luke 2, 21 down through 39, he gives us three examples to follow in response to true wonder. And so as we walk through these, I want to encourage you to consider um, in your own life, are these attitudes, these examples that we see, are they reflected in how you live? Is there an ongoing change, a growing, increasing change in your life because of the work of God? The first example we see is an example of obedience. I like science fiction stories, and you know, in science fiction, robots are, all, are portrayed as almost human. Right? They're able to learn, they're able to make choices. But in real life, it doesn't work that way. Right? In real life, uh, robots are machines that are programmed to follow a specific set of instructions. They can't understand the reasons for those instructions. They can't evaluate uh, whether the instructions are good or bad. They just follow a program. Now, God's given us instructions to follow. But he doesn't want our obedience to be robotic. Right? He, he doesn't want you to just follow mindlessly. He created you with the ability to think and to understand and to make choices. And, and he wants us to, to trust him, to rely upon his goodness and wisdom. And so uh, the, the wonder of who God is and how he works, that's designed to inspire us to obey willingly and gladly. Now, the, the interesting thing about that is, then is as we obey, then obedience actually helps us understand more. And it generates and it inspi can inspire a continuing sense of wonder. So Luke gives us the example of Mary and Joseph's obedience to the Old Testament law. Take a look at uh, Luke 2, 21 through 24 there. It tells us, And at the end of eight days, after the birth of Jesus, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So we have these Old Testament rituals here, and they could certainly be performed in a thoughtless, robotic way, 
But what I want to point out in looking at this, these verses here is that God designed those rituals, those activities, to communicate wondrous saving truths. And in fact, the significance of these rituals is even more amazing when you think about Jesus and his parents participating in them. So let's, let's walk back through these. I mean, first, uh, there in, in verse 21, it mentions circumcision. Right? Circumcision uh, was in, initiated for the Jewish people with Abraham almost around 2,000 years before the time of Christ. And so Genesis 17, uh, verse 11 introduces the idea of circumcision. God said to Abraham, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. See, it's all about this idea of a covenant. The whole idea was that Abraham's descendants had this privilege of knowing God. And as we read elsewhere in the Old Testament, particularly in, in Deuteronomy 10, it talks about circumcision as being this physical reminder that they were supposed to be humble. They were supposed to be teachable before God, not stubborn or hard-hearted. Now, when you think of Jesus being circumcised, he didn't need that reminder, did he? I mean, he had a relationship with God outside of the covenant. He was the son of God. He had a perfect relationship with God. But he, his, he, he is circumcised as a way to identify him with God's covenant people, right? with, with the people of Israel. And, and so the amazing thing is that, of course, the saving work that Jesus would go on to do was the very thing that would fulfill the whole significance of what circumcision was supposed to show. Right? The only way that we can have hearts that are teachable and humble before God is if He works in us through the saving power of Christ, right? And so here He was, being circumcised, the one who would make it possible for our hearts to be transformed. Now, so we have circumcision, and then the next ritual that comes out here is purification. Uh, it's mentioned there in verse 22, and that comes from Leviticus chapter 12. Uh, when we read that, that chapter in Leviticus, it tells us that for the first 40 days after the birth of a son, uh, the mother was considered unclean. So she couldn't participate in the ceremonies at the, at that point it was the tabernacle and then later on the temple. For a daughter that time span was doubled. And so afterward, after that period passed, the mother was required to bring, it says in Leviticus 12, a lamb for a burnt offering and a pigeon for a sin offering to atone for her uncleanness. And it says, it adds at the end of Leviticus 12, if, if she cannot afford a lamb, she was supposed to bring two pigeons. So that's what Mary does. Right? She doesn't have, apparently didn't have the resources to offer up a lamb. And so she just offers up the two pigeons. Well, that whole idea of uncleanness, it's like, well, why did they do that? Why would, why would giving birth be considered unclean? What's the point of that? I mean, some people think, well, is it some hygiene thing? Well, I mean, when you read through the Old Testament, the significance of some of those rules about cleanness it's never really stated clearly. But I suspect, no, this is me, I think the point, uh, it points us to the reality that all sickness, all suffering in this world is a result of Adam and Eve's sin, right? It's not that there's anything immoral about having a child, that's not the point. But it, it is a result, we know sickness is, is a result of of that first sin, not our individual sin, necessarily. I mean, even the pain of childbirth, right? We go back to Genesis 3, verse 16, part of the curse was that the woman would experience pain in, in giving birth. So here's the thing. In the Levitical system of worship in the Old Testament, people were not allowed to draw near to, to God unless they were completely healthy. You see that in the qualifications for the priests and 
and all of the different rules that they're, they're so confusing to us. But it's all designed to teach a lesson. I think what it points us to is what we find when we get to the end of the Bible. When we look at that time, that new heaven and earth, when the curse is removed, where there's no more sickness, there's no more physical suffering, right? We read about it in Revelation 21 and 22. The, the tabernacle was supposed to be an object lesson of that future time when God was present with us. So, of course, the irony here in, in our story is that here Mary is giving birth to the one who's going to fulfill that hope, but she still has to go through the ritual of purification. I mean, think about it. During his life, Jesus showed his power to heal. Why? As a preview of what awaits us in eternity. And then through his death, he provides the perfect atonement for all of our sins so that we can draw near to God without any hindrance, right? And then, of course, when he returns in the future, he'll conquer sin and death to lead us into that perfect existence in the presence of God, everything that the tabernacle and the temple was pointing to. And so here you have, you know, this little family going through this ritual. And there's so much behind it. Right? There's so much significance of what's taking place there. The third ritual that we see in the passage is uh, the dedication of firstborn sons. And that goes back to Exodus chapter 13, the whole story of the Passover. You remember that story, right? The ten plagues. Uh, as the Israelites were in Egypt, and the last plague, the crowning plague to break uh, the stubborn uh, Pharaoh's heart was the death of all the firstborns. And the idea was for the Israelites, by sacrificing a lamb and spreading its blood on their doorposts, uh, that uh, the avenging angel, as it passed through the angel of the Lord, would not enter their home, would, not, uh, would spare their household from this plague. But the stipulation that's given there is that in all subsequent generations, because of that Passover, firstborns were always supposed to be devoted to the Lord. And so what that meant was, is with animals, the firstborn of an animal was supposed to be sacrificed. And with a firstborn son, they were supposed to be redeemed, right? to be uh, purchased in a sense. Right? And so the Jews were commanded in Numbers 18, verses 15 and 16, to bring an offering of five shekels of silver. And why? Because it was showing that, that object lesson of the story of redemption. So Luke doesn't mention anything about money here in, in Luke 2, but when it talks about them bringing Jesus to the temple to present him, that's probably what was happening. He was probably paying that redemption price. So think about, again, the irony of it. He's paying, you know, a little bit of money to redeem the Redeemer of all mankind, right? It's a mind-blowing kind of idea, right? He's the, here's the Lamb of God, the true Passover. And this ceremony is designed to point back to that whole story and yet at the same time to look ahead to what he would do. Now, you know, how much did Mary and Joseph understand about all these ideas, we don't really know. But what I want you to see is that these acts of obedience were designed to teach. They were designed to, to remind and instruct people. As New Testament believers, we're not under the law of Moses. We don't, we don't have to follow those rituals. But even in whenever we obey, I think there's always a sense of that ongoing teaching and learning and understanding who uh, God is. Paul talks about that in Romans 12, verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, true obedience is not supposed to be robotic. It's not just about a list. It's about a relationship with God. 
And the idea here is that as you obey, as you work through that and think through you know, how to live your life, it helps you understand God and His will. It leads you deeper in your relationship with Him. And so true wonder is not supposed to be just an experience that you have and then you move on. It's supposed to be something that leads to obedience. We have that example of Joseph and Mary. Now the next example, as we continue on in Luke 2, is an example of waiting. We don't like to be kept waiting, Right? I mean, our society is very time conscious. We're always trying to speed things up so that we can fit more in. Uh, We finish one experience and we move on to the next one and and we tend to not to look back. Um, Especially this time of year, the beginning of the year, people are always talking about time management, right? And books and videos of how to manage your time. But God doesn't always work that way. In fact, if we're hasty about life, and uh, sometimes that undermines what God wants to do in our lives. Uh, God gives us moments of wonder, but often the lesson is that we would learn to wait for something better. The whole idea of waiting. And so Luke introduces us to a man named Simeon. And he's an example of this attitude. Take a look at Luke 2, 25 through 26. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. Here it is. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. See, life was difficult for the people of Israel. They suffered oppression under one empire after another. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. I mean, we're talking hundreds of years uh, that were just discouraging, that were difficult. And on top of that, as a nation, they were internally divided. Some people sought the Lord, other people ignored him. You had different factions. You had the uh, hypocritical, legalistic Pharisees. You had the, the kind of a literal or liberal compromising Sadducees. You had uh, violent uh, zealots. Right? Their, their society was pretty divided. I'm sure it was hard. I'm sure it was discouraging and disheartening. And so Simeon, he was desperately waiting for God to come and, and comfort Israel, right? This consolation, that's what he was looking for. He was was looking for God to fulfill his Old Testament promises, to to lead Israel into spiritual obedience, right? A true transformation of heart. And to change their place in the world politically, to give them victory. And so Simeon had this wondrous experience of receiving a revelation from the Holy Spirit. We don't know at what point in his life this happened, but, but he, he came to understand that he would have the opportunity to see the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One during his lifetime. And so we don't know how many years he waited. But the moment finally comes. Take a look at Luke 2, 27-32. It says, He came in the Spirit into the temple... And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. See, I think... Simeon's response here, it reveals the mindset that enabled him to wait upon God. Look at how he begins there in verse 29. He uses the word Lord. But it's a different word in Greek. It's a different word than the one that's normally used to refer to God. Uh, The normal word is 
curios and curios. And here it's, it's despotes. It means master. Right? See, I think we get impatient because we think we're the master. And then everything else, including God, everyone else is supposed to serve us and what we want. But that wasn't how Simeon viewed life. He thought of himself as the, a humble slave serving the purpose of God. And so once he saw Jesus, he felt as if he had completed his life's mission. It's like, that, that's it. I'm ready to die now. <laughs> that's how he felt. And he, and he was confident that Jesus would open the eyes of the Gentile nation. They would see the light. He was confident that he would restore the glory of God's presence in Israel. Now, he wasn't naive about how that would transpire or how people would respond to Jesus. He knew full well that the process would be, uh, would be painful. Take a look at verses 33 through 35. It says, uh, you know, again, speaking of Joseph and Mary and uh, Jesus' parents and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed." See, he knew there was, that conflict was coming. He knew that, that Jesus, just through his ministry, would bring out what was in people's hearts. Right? Some people were going to oppose him arrogantly and violently. And that would lead to their own spiritual downfall. That's what he's talking about when he talks about the fall of many in Israel. But on the other hand, some people would receive Jesus. They would rise because of their faith. And he anticipated that Mary, as she observed all of this, would experience great pain right, as she watched her son suffer. I think, in a sense, we can identify with that. I mean, Jesus talks about it, that that kind of conflict, that kind of division is something that always accompanies the gospel. We see it um, and even in the people we care about and how they respond to Jesus. Some believe, right? Others resist. And there's this sense here that we can't lose hope. We have to adopt this mindset that we see here in Simeon. To see ourselves as God's humble servants. And even in the times when the world seems out of control, we have to continue to wait upon him to work uh, in people's hearts, to fulfill his promises through Christ. You know, there's an interesting passage that I think is, is kind of parallel to this in, in the Old Testament, in the Psalm, Psalm 25. Um, let's just look at a few of the verses here in Psalm 25, uh, beginning in verse 1. David writes, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait, there it is, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. And then he continues, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. And here it is, for you I wait all the day long. I mean, that's, those are good words for us, an example, an attitude, right? A perspective of how we look at life. We like to think that we can control everything. Even people around us, right? That we can manipulate circumstances and twist people's arms and get them to do things. And that's not what God wants. He wants us to wait upon him. He wants us to trust. He wants us to rely upon him and have this patient confidence that God's going to, God's going to, to work according to his plan. And so when we have those moments where we, we learn about God, those moments of wonder, they should prompt us to, 
to respond like David did, to lift up our souls to God, to offer ourselves to Him in humble trust and service. Are you waiting upon the Lord? Is that a characteristic, an attitude in your life? That's what we see here in Simeon. There's one more example in this passage, and it's an example of worship. You know, our light sources keep improving, right? These LED lights uh, that, that are the big thing now. I mean, manufacturers claim that they'll last like 50,000 hours. I mean, that's like, that's like turning on a light and letting it go for over six years. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of crazy, almost six years. I mean, the old incandescent light bulbs... They were only supposed to last around 1,000 hours. It's like seven months. And then, of course, if you go further back in history, right, when people used candles or oil lamps, I mean, you had to constantly be working to keep light burning. Well, when you think about worshiping God, worshiping God is more like an oil lamp than like an LED bulb. Okay, you don't... It's not like a moment of wonder flips on the switch and then the light lasts for years to come in terms of a relationship with God. That's not how it works. That spiritual spark that we experience sometimes has to be fed and maintained. In fact, it's interesting because in the instructions God gave Moses in building the tabernacle, they had this oil lamp in the, in the tabernacle and then later the temple, and it was supposed to be kept burning all the time. It always had to be filled and the wicks taken care of and all that sort of stuff. And so Luke, here in, 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 as he finishes off this part of the story, he gives us an example of worship in a woman named Anna. Take a look at Luke 2, 36 through 38. Luke says there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting, the most common word for worship, as you read through the New Testament, it conveys the idea of bowing before someone. Uh, and so it kind of has the sense of, or at least it could refer to a one-time act. But that's not the word that Luke uses here. As he talks about Anna worshiping, he uses a word that kind of has the connotation of priestly service, right? As a lifelong calling. Now, Anna was not a priest. She wasn't even from a priestly family. And so she couldn't literally live in the temple courts. There was no way that she could do that. But the idea, I think, is that every morning and evening, the priests would offer sacrifices, they would burn incense, they would take care of that lampstand in the temple. And, and when that happened, people would come to pray. And so Anna was sort of always there, right? She took advantage of every opportunity to worship God. Now, I think what's interesting about that is you look at her life, and she lost her husband early in her marriage. Right? Some people say she was 84 years old. That that's, Interpret the verse that way. Some people think it means she was... She had lived 84 years after the death of her husband. She could have been much older. And so you think that could leave someone bitter. But you don't see that here with her. We see these activities Luke talks about that were part of her worship. First, it says that she fasted. Right? In other words, I think the way to think about fasting is that she was so wrapped up in worship she would just skip a meal. She would go without eating sometimes. Next, the idea was, he simply says that she prayed. 
Right? In other words, she, she lifted her concerns and her needs to God. It was, she had this spirit of dependence upon the Lord. And then thirdly, here in this moment, she gives thanks. Now, of course, that was probably prompted by seeing Jesus or by, perhaps by hearing what Simeon was saying about him. But, I mean, it was also probably a, a, a habit that she had cultivated, Right? She, she was in, she had the, the practice, the discipline of acknowledging God's blessings, of, of showing that kind of humble gratitude. And then fourthly, she, you know, Luke says that she spoke to people. And she began encouraging people that God's promises of redemption were going to be fulfilled. And so what you see in Anna is that every part of her life really revolved around the worship of God. That's how it's supposed to be for all of us. Paul uses that same word, that priest-like worship term, in Romans 12, verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual Worship. Right, that captures what we're talking about. This, there's a sense of wonder when you first learn about God's mercy and grace, that how he provides for our forgiveness in Christ. But the understanding of those, God's mercy then should lead to this response to offering up our lives to him. And so we should be people who follow that example of Anna, who who do fast and pray and give thanks and speak truth. We should be devoted to the worship of God. So Luke concludes the story, uh, this story in verse 39, by directing our attention back to Joseph and Mary. Take a look. He says, When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Now, it's interesting. Uh, if, if, if you've looked at Matthew's gospel, right, Matthew talks about other things that happened. He talks about the coming of the wise men, right? And King Herod, about how King Herod tried to have Jesus killed and how the family fled to Egypt. Luke doesn't tell us where all of that fits in this, how all of that fits together. He, he doesn't give us those details. And I think the reason he does that is that his point is just to show us that Joseph and Mary and Jesus, eventually they settled back into family life in Nazareth. Right? It may have not been right away, um, but eventually they made it back to Nazareth. And these incredible events that Luke talks about, all of the angelic appearances and and you know, people coming and seeing who he was and, and prophecies and all these things, all of that stopped. Life just became normal, right? Husband, a wife, a baby growing up. Um, and yet, we think that Luke learned of all of these details from, probably from Mary. And so I have to think that Simeon and Anna made such an impression on Mary that she included it as she recounted the story. Right? These examples of lifelong devotion. So think about that. How would you characterize your devotion to the Lord? Are you growing in through obedience? You have that spirit of waiting upon God to accomplish his work in the world and in the lives of people. Are you faithfully worshiping him day and night? If not, then today's an opportunity to, to change, right? If you've never done so, now's a time to begin worshiping the Lord. To receive Christ as, as your Lord and Savior and begin to, to follow and and to have that, to offer up your heart. If you have received him, then uh, maybe one of these examples kind of highlights maybe something that's missing from your life.
Uh, maybe you need to focus on one of these examples uh, in the coming days and, and to, to think about, you know, maybe it's that attitude of waiting upon the Lord or, or a focus on obedience or, or worship. You might want to go back and read Psalm 25. It's a great prayer of David that um, capsulizes some of these same ideas. I pray that our devotion to the Lord won't be a, a momentary flash, but it'll be this steadily growing flame.